This program is made possible by the members and donors to the show. To support the work we do for as little as a buck a month, or to sign up as a member and get commercial-free versions of every episode, plus members-only bonus content, sign up at patreon.com slash bestoftheleft, or visit the Contribute tab at bestoftheleft.com. Now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast, in which we shall learn about some of the reasons for the rise of right-wing movements around the world, some of the various shapes they're taking, strategies they're following, and an emerging trend that may lend them additional momentum in the future. Clips today come from The Diane Rehm Show, Ideas from the CBC, This Is Hell, Start Making Sense from The Nation magazine, The Good Fight, and a TED Talk by Yuval Noah Harari. Which leaders around the world do you see falling into that category? Well, let me just say, some of the countries that I talk about, and I will, also have elements of fascism. I think, frankly, the only country I've just flat out said is fascist is North Korea, because there is complete control. Uh, There is fear that has been instilled. Um, There is a uh, family that controls everything, the, the Kim family. They also practice uh, a way of treating their people where they have put them in, in labor camps and this dedication to a leader um, that is almost, uh, you know, that they think they're godlike. So that is the only country that I just flat out say is fascist. The countries that I talk about that trouble me a great deal are um, what is going on in Hungary, and there was just an election there, the sham election. Um, and then Poland, Turkey, uh, and Venezuela are the countries that I spend, and then the Philippines. Um, and those are countries where the leaders have, again, undermined any system of freedom and democracy uh, and see themselves as the the answer to everybody's problems. What I find really appalling, however, that those countries, all those people actually got elected. So why do you believe those countries and the people within them are so vulnerable to that kind of approach now? Well, I do think, and it's a little bit different in each one of them, but I think that um, especially the countries in uh, Poland and Hungary, um, in Central and Eastern Europe, there are historic aspects to this. And this is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. And those countries, basically Poland had existed but had been partitioned many times. Hungary had been one of the leaders of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but all of a sudden they were independent. And they treasure their independence and their nationalism. What I think is interesting is because they feel that they hadn't been able to recover from all the aspects of communism, they there are people in the, both those countries that feel that they haven't gotten enough of the economic pie, that they have not been really able to live a good so-called Western life, uh, and they are looking for some easy answers. And in Hungary's case, what makes it even more complicated, they are, this is very anti-immigrant. And so Viktor Orban has made very clear that all the problems that exist in Hungary have to do with migrants. And so there is this hyper-nationalism, that's one part of it, a sense that they have not been able to make the strides they wanted to in the post-communist world, and leaders who are willing and capable of mobilizing negative feelings on behalf of their own power structure and supporting their power. Would you say that in this country there are elements of exactly those same characteristics going on? Well, I do think that every country has divisions. There's no question. And the question is, how are they handled by the leaders? And so, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant, a refugee. And when we came to the United States in 1948, 49, and we lived in Denver in the 50s, it was such a middle-class country to us and very different from some of the divisions that we had seen in Europe. And, uh, and maybe 
there have always been divisions, but it was very clear recently that maybe as a result of new technology, people were losing their jobs. Um, there also was something that I'd never seen before, the 1% that really had everything and then everybody else. And so I do see the division. So then what happens is I think, again, uh, there are those who have wanted to exacerbate those decision uh, divisions. And then also, I think there has been a sense, uh, and President Trump has really encouraged this even more, is that we're being taken advantage of by the world. And so yeah, I'm very, a very proud American. Patriotism is one thing. Hypernationalism is dangerous. And that is what the America first part of things uh, the whole talking about that everybody, uh, that we're a victim, which is ridiculous. This country is the most powerful country in the world. So I do think there are elements of that. And the part about fascism that I find so different than just authoritarian dictatorship is that there is this kind of rising from the bottom of people that are unhappy for one reason or another, and then a charlatan demagogic leader who then can take advantage of what's coming from the bottom and making it even worse and blaming somebody else. So there are elements of that in this country at the moment that does worry me that we are, quote, victims and then blaming immigrants uh, all of a sudden, uh, all these people coming in that are either taking jobs or are terrorists or are raping people. Do you believe that Donald Trump is a charlatan and demagogic leader? I think he is a demagogic leader. And by the way, I actually think that he's brilliant at it. He knows exactly how to plug in in terms of making people angry at somebody and finding people to blame for this. And then he also... Uh, while many of us don't like the fact that he has such a limited vocabulary, it is one that, in fact, gets people kind of thinking that he's that he doesn't change his mind. That this is what he does. This is this is how he is, and that he does have a better idea for this country. And so I think that he he I think he is uh, a demagogue. take you a little bit back, um, not very far, uh, in early 2000s, you might remember there was so much optimism within academia and media. You will remember reading so many articles predicting that the liberal order was going to experience an amazing universal triumph and history would always move forward. You will remember there was so much confidence in that liberal order. And in a way, there was a dualistic way of reading world order, right? As if there was a dualistic geography. Some parts of the world were regarded as liquid lands. They were volatile. They were unsettled, choppy waters. And some other parts of the world, mostly the West, were regarded as safe, stable, and steady. So feminism, activism, human rights, these were things that were needed for the liquid lands, not necessarily the solid lands, because the solid lands were thought to be beyond that stage. And I think one of the many reasons why we're here today is because this notion, this dualistic notion of geography has been shattered. Um, in the year 2016, with Brexit, with Trump's election, with populist movements from the Philippines all the way to Austria, one after another. Now we know that actually no place is that solid. Yeah? No, in no place we can take democracy for granted in that way. And in fact, as the late Zygmunt Bauman had warned us long ago, we're all living in liquid times. And that's why we're all, we're all connected. I want to talk about dualities because I think they matter so much. Yes, perhaps if you ask Marine Le Pen, she will call herself, and she has done this, in many interviews she calls herself an, a Democrat. But that doesn't mean that she is a Democrat. 
You know, Trump uses the word very fine people for uh, people who go to Charlottesville with supremacist ideas. That doesn't mean they're very fine people. We have to see these underlying ideologies that are like echoes of one another. In some countries, they're more visible, like in Turkey. In some countries, a bit less visible, but they're there, like in Hungary and Poland. And in some other countries, we see the seeds. And it's quite confusing because populism has experienced a surge in crisis-ridden countries like Greece, but also in relatively quite wealthy countries like Sweden. So how do we connect this? One of the things that populist discourse, because it is a discourse that does, is to create its own myths, is to create its own dualities. Populist demagogues need an other all the time. And one of the biggest dualities that we are being fed constantly is this duality between the real people and the elite. I want to question that. No one can convince me that easily that Marine Le Pen herself is not part of the elite, or Heath Wilders is not part of the elite, or Trump himself is not part of the financial elite. But their success is in presenting themselves as if they were not part of this establishment, as if they have been zoomed from another planet and therefore they're completely clean. There is no such thing. What we are experiencing is a shift between elites. Yes, let's be critical of elitism, but let's also understand that this is also an elite, a different elite with a different ideology. And secondly, in my opinion, let's be very cautious about this over-romanticization of the real people. This is a dangerous road that does, yes, go all the way back to nationalism and tribalism. This idea that the real people are so pure and innocent and whatever they decide in the ballot box is the right decision can go in very dangerous directions. And also it feeds into an anti-intellectual, uh, anti-knowledge discourse. We live in an age in which information can very easily be confused with knowledge and knowledge can can be very easily confused with wisdom, but they are completely different things. But I don't want you to get me wrong. I think emotions are incredibly important. Cultural clashes are incredibly important. Samuel Huntington used to claim there was a clash between civilizations. That is not true, but there is a clash within nations, a clash of cultures, a clash of perceptions. We need to pay more attention to emotions. And I think ours is the age of anxiety, of fear, of fear of the other, fear of the future. And it would be a tremendous mistake to belittle these emotions. And this, in my opinion, is one of the many mistakes that many elites have made throughout the decades. We might not feel the same emotions, but it is a big mistake to belittle them. I'm a foreigner myself, but I understand the fear of the other. I understand the anxiety about immigration. And I think it is okay to have fear. What is not okay is to be led by fear. And I, in my opinion, countries have made the worst mistakes in their history when they let themselves to be guided by fear. And unfortunately, we live in an age in which populist demagogues do exploit these fears. When you look at them, all these extremists might be completely disconnected, an Islamist preacher somewhere, a supremacist orator somewhere else, but they are connected, and they feed each other, and they need each other, because they all thrive upon this climate of fear. In my opinion, we have entered in a new age in which citizens' initiatives, bottom-up movements, are going to be much more important than ever. Countries like Turkey, what we have experienced in Turkey, our example has shown the world the fragility of democracy. How do you deal with the kind of movements that come from within democracy, use the means of democracy, and once they consolidate their power, use that power in order to suppress all other voices of dissent? And this is the danger of populism, because it comes from within democracy. And it also shows us that none of us can take democracy for granted. It's a very delicate ecosystem. So the ballot box in itself is not enough to sustain a democracy. If we don't have a robust civil society, actively involved citizens, if we don't have rule of law, separation of powers, and yes, definitely a free media and independent academia, and women's rights, and minority rights, without all these components, the ballot box in itself will not be enough to sustain 
sustain a democracy. It will move towards majoritarianism, and from majoritarianism to authoritarianism, it's a very short step. So I just want to finish by saying, uh, I think it's so much is going to depend on all of us. Global solidarity, global activism, and global sisterhood will become uh, much more significant and urgent than ever before. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, which provides affordable, private online counseling. When you sign up at betterhelp.com best, you get unlimited access to a licensed, trained, fully accredited therapist on your phone and computer through text, voice, or video chat. And of course, they're LGBT-friendly. It's great for individuals or couples counseling for anything you're going through in life right now, and of course, in this political climate who couldn't use a little extra help. When you get started, you fill out a questionnaire so they can match you with a counselor who's perfect for you, and you can start counseling today. But if you decide you don't vibe with the therapist you're matched with, you can switch whenever you want. It's less expensive than in-person counseling, but you're still getting the same great help from licensed professionals. A lot of people are not comfortable talking to a therapist in person, or they simply don't have the time, but with better help, you connect from anywhere you are, at home, work, or on the go, and if you have trouble affording it, BetterHelp even has financial aid available. You can sign up right now and save on quality professional therapy by going to betterhelp.com best. You can take a step towards supporting your own mental health and support this show at the same time by using our link to let them know we sent you. That's betterhelp.com best, and that link is in our show notes. You were mentioning the Overton window earlier, and you write that journalistic commentary can't help but take on the received terminology of the day, which is opaque, circular, and constrained by the Overton window, a concept defined by the political scientist Joseph Overton as the range of ideas the public will accept. As the philosopher Robert Unger notes, the Overton window is not in reality fixed. It's a bastardized conception of political realism, which is proximity to the existent. The word Brexit is an example of this. A word that gains currency, validation, and meaning it doesn't deserve uh, the, through frequent political and journalistic usage. Deploying the accepted terminology defines you as part of the conversation, but the conversation is not connected to any theoretical or historically contextualized understanding of what is going on. So how much do we legitimize things like Brexit or even here in the U.S., in the, US uh, the alt-right, simply by using the term? How much do the words mm. we use constrain our political ima- imagination leading to an opposition to politics of all kinds. Mm, yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's absolutely gets to the heart of the problem. Things like meme culture, which is, you know, sharing these memes online, often kind of humorous references to what's going on. It's almost as if, I mean, the problem with meme culture is that it's not really critical of what's going on. It's just, it's a sort of a, it's a riff. Um, on what's going on, it's, it it doesn't actually ever really penetrate, or or doesn't actually gain purchase on on the the problem or the situation. I think what we have now, and I think I think social media has a lot to to answer for in this respect, is that um, it's about um, terms that that define um, your your sort of membership of a group or your understanding of a situation, your familiarity. You find this with um, the more kind of obscure um, alt-right groups, actually, on on the internet. That there's that that in the discussion boards, those groups, there's a set this use of terms which um, so-called normies don't understand, and that your use of these terms defines your membership. Um, and I think that again, I mean, it creates echo chambers of conversations which other people can't participate in in terms of a democratic conversation. But also, it means that there's no, there's no, there's no political critique um, coming from the public conversation. It's just this endless circulation of of received terminology. So, in Brexit, as an example of this, I mean, it's so ironic, you know, at a time when we need more than ever before to be talking about the the gap, the wealth gap between the one percent and the ninety nine percent. We find ourselves talking about absolutely technocratic um you know topics like what we're going to do about the 
um, regulation of fishing um, <laughs> or, um, you know, customs rules. Um, and so, you know, and it's so ironic because actually the whole, the entire populist uprising was in a sense a reaction against technocratic politics. You know, it was a reaction against um, experts um, sort of running the country. And um, and actually the irony is that we had this great populist uprising with Brexit um, and we've got now technocratic rule, you know, even more than we, we had before. So that that didn't end well. I and mean, I think Brexit... Brexit is a very interesting example because I think Brexit, for me, really exemplifies anti-politics. You know, Brex- the Brexiteers, they weren't really against the EU, the European Union. They were against, it was, it was sort of public anger that was channeled by this very small group of very elite, um, you know, multi-millionaire, private school educated Far right politicians. Um, it was it was public anger was whipped up against the political system, and so Brexit. The reason why, and, I, and there's clear parallels with with the election of Trump in the US, that it's 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 taking public anger, which should be directed against the super rich, against economic injustice, and directed it against politicians. And um, we get rid of politics, politicians, and we end up with uh, despotism. And now for the midterms minute, a look at the candidates and races you need to know about, shout about, and support to make sure we have a blue tsunami on November 6th. As the primaries keep coming, progressive candidates are proving their message resonates across the country, and religious, racial, and gender barriers are being broken down along the way. You can help keep this progressive tide rolling by getting involved, no matter what state you live in. Both Justice Democrats and Brand New Congress offer Get Out the Vote Online, Calling and Texting texting tools with scripts on individual candidates, allowing you to talk to voters from the comfort of home. This is a great way to make a real impact, and we've included links to both tools in the show notes. Today we're talking about Arizona and Florida, which both have primaries coming up on August 28th. In Arizona, Deidre Abood is a Justice Democrat and immigration and estate planning attorney running for Jeff Flake's soon-to-be-empty Senate seat. Her campaign is focused primarily on getting special interests and lobbying money out of politics, and she has been endorsed by the National Organization for Women, Vote Pro-Choice, and more. She also happens to be a former Christian who converted to Islam and has faced threats on her life and online abuse during this campaign from far-right groups. In Arizona's 2nd District, Mary Matiella is running for Congress. Matiella is the former CFO of the U.S. Forest Service, a former assistant CFO of Housing and Urban Development, and was nominated by President Obama to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Army. She is also a Justice Democrat who has endorsements from Demand Universal Healthcare, Democracy for America, and Common Defense. Veteran and former teacher David Garcia is leading in the Democratic primary for governor of Arizona. Garcia supports Medicare for All, tuition-free public college, wants Arizona to become a solar superpower, and is not accepting lobbyist campaign contributions. He's been endorsed by Latino Victory, the Working Families Party, People's Action, NARAL Pro-Choice Arizona, and more. If he wins, he will face current Arizona governor and Republican Doug Ducey in November. Garcia is already facing some of the $7 million in opposition efforts from the Republican Governors Association, which attack his position to replace ICE with a system that, quote, reflects our values. The voter registration deadline to participate in the Arizona primary was July 30th. If you are registered by then, early voting is going on right now. A heads up that voter registration deadline for the general election is October 9th. We now turn to Florida. Veteran and civil rights activist Chardo Richardson is a Justice Democrat and brand new Congress congressional candidate for Florida's 7th District. He's running on Medicare for All, an end to the for-profit justice system, and an end to super PACs. In Florida's 8th District, Sanjay Patel is a first-generation immigrant and former small business owner running for Congress. His campaign focuses on ensuring fair wages and a reasonable cost of living for all working people, and, of course, he supports Medicare for All. 
In Florida's 18th district, Pam Keith is a Justice Democrat running to unseat Republican Brian Mast. Her campaign is focused on reform of the broken criminal justice system and closing the income gap. In Florida's 26th district, Debbie Mukarsal Powell is running for Congress. She's been endorsed by End Citizens United, Latino Victory, NARAL, Common Defense, Planned Parenthood, and Moms Demand Action. Michael Hepburn is a Justice Democrat and brand new Congress candidate running in Florida's 27th district. Hepburn is a former Fortune 500 company executive and academic advisor at the University of Miami Business School. He is advocating for universal pre-K to tuition-free public colleges, universities, and trade schools, a $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, the end of mass incarceration, and rebuilding the economy with renewable energy and infrastructure repairs. Florida's Democratic Senator Bill Nelson is up for re-election and facing Florida Governor Rick Scott in November. Since Rick Scott has reached his term limit and is now running for Senate, Floridians will be voting for a new governor. Mayor of Tallahassee Andrew Gillum has recently been endorsed by Bernie Sanders, Democracy for America, and Women's March Florida, and is picking up steam in the polls against his primary opponent, Gwen Graham. He's fighting for a $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, abolishing ICE, a ban on assault weapons, an end to the Stand Your Ground law, marijuana legalization, restoration of voting rights for felons, and more. As we've mentioned, the national importance of this race is that whoever holds the office will be involved in the state's redistricting process following the 2020 census. You must have been registered to vote by July 30th to participate in the Florida primary. Early voting is going on now. If you didn't make the cutoff, be sure to be ready for the general by registering by October 9th. We want to emphasize registration cutoff dates and absentee ballot request and submission dates are different for each state, sometimes even each county. We highly suggest reviewing your state's information and voter ID laws at rockthevote.org as soon as possible to ensure you will be able to vote in both the primary and general elections. We know you heard a lot of names and dates today, but we hope you will take a moment to check the segment notes, which include all of the links to this information as well as additional resources. And today's Midterm Minute, just like every activism segment we produce, is archived and organized under the Activism tab at bestoftheleft.com. So if building the bluest of blue waves is important to you, be sure to hit the share button to spread the word about supporting progressive candidates across the country via social media so that others in your network can spread the word too. Lots of our friends on the left have been calling Trump a fascist. The New Republic published a piece headlined, Yes, Trump is a Fascist. Madeleine Albright wrote a book about Trump called Fascism, A Warning. On the other hand, we have too many friends who call things fascist just because they they don't like them. Historians, I'm a historian, mean something specific when they talk about fascism. They get a little picky about this. Mussolini and then Hitler ran one-party states that eliminated opposition parties. They had government-controlled media. They banned opposition newspapers and radio. They had government-controlled unions that replaced independent unions. I submit that the United States has nothing like this under Trump. Do you think we should call Trumpism fascism? Well, you know, I always would have said no. Uh, I don't like that word being thrown around because I'm kind of pedantic, and I think that fascism referred to a specific historical uh, development uh, that came out of uh, devastating World War I, drastic economic upheaval compared to what we have now is nothing. The fear of Bolshevism was very big. And I think that, you know, when uh, Naomi Wolf and others said that George W. Bush what this was that was fascism and it was going to be just like 1930s germany and i'm thinking oh really did anybody did they believe that bush would simply cancel elections and refuse to leave the white house <laughs> i mean fascism also involves the army you have to control the army yeah. sometimes you have to have your own private army hitler did that mussolini did that so it, to make a long story short i didn't like the use of this word but I, and maybe it isn't the right word for where we seem to be heading. And one reason for that, people forget this. Uh, and I remember it was very shocked when many, many years ago, an Italian friend of mine said, well, you know, Mussolini did some good things for people. 
<laughs> and I, for years, I thought, oh, my God, Vittorio, he's really strange. <laughs> but, uh, but one of the big things that fascism was always about was big government. Yes. Um, it, yeah, big government. It was jobs for the boys. It was building the Autobahn, draining the swamps of malaria in, near Rome, all that kind of thing. And American conservatism is not at all interested, in, as we've discovered, in infrastructure um, and providing work for people. So that's another big difference. And yet, you know, now I'm thinking, okay, we've got Putin, we've got Donald Trump, we have Modi in Italy, in, in India, uh, we have all those conservative parties in Western Europe, uh, we have Egypt, we have a lot of what Viktor Orban of Hungary call illiberal democracies. If they have the form of democracy, there are still elections, there are still opposition parties, and yet somehow things just keep going in an autocratic and authoritarian direction. Well, one of the key anti-democratic programs that Trump has pursued, of course, is voter repression. If there's anything that weakens democracy, it's stopping people from voting, especially when they're your opponents. But of course, that's not really Trump's project. That was been the Republican project for a couple of decades now, and Trump was just the kind of unintended beneficiary uh, of that. Who, whoever had been the Republican candidate would have benefited for, from vote suppression. So this part is not really Trumpism. This is, this is the Republican project. Yeah, I don't think they're all that distinguishable in many respects. But I think Trump is special in that one of the features of fascism is, is the cult, the personal cult of the leader. Yes. You always had that. And Putin definitely has that. And Trump has it too. And they both have this strong man personality and they're admired for that. And the rallies where the followers cheer oh. the unique qualities of their leader. That certain certain yeah. echoes there oh. are unmistakable. Right. And the, the the cult of violence. That's another similarity. I mean, Trump is always, you know, at those rallies urging his followers to beat up some poor schmo who happens you know, who happens to be there and raises you know, raises a hand in protest. To me, one of the one of the most important things about Trump and Putin and Modi and uh, the guy in Turkey is yeah. targeting the enemy within. This has always been a theme. We must purify yeah. our country of enemies. And those people have different skin color, different religions, different ethnicity. This is a standard feature of fascist movements everywhere, isn't it? Yes, that's a very good point. And so you find Erdogan is, you know, trashing the universities, coming down hard on the Kurds. You find Orban in Hungary, who is one of the prototypical figures of, of this, is a very anti-Semitic. In Poland, the Peace and Justice Party uh, is very proud of the pseudo-fact that Poland is one of the most ethnically homogeneous states in the world. That's just because they don't count the Ukrainians who live there. But, uh, you know, and so you're, you're absolutely right. And look at Modi. I and mean, look what they're doing with the Muslims now, in yeah. the, the, the Muslims in India. Um, and here in America, sure enough, we've got the whole thing with the immigrants, like, which, is, which they also have in many very, very, you know, liberal welfare state countries in Europe, like, um, like Denmark, where they've become really racist. One more question about what unites fascistic movements around the world. Is there anything about their treatment of women that we should notice? Well, yeah, there is. And, you know, for some reason, this illiberal democracy or fascism or whatever you want to call it always goes along with repression of women. It always goes along with a certain kind of masculinist, you know, male urge to world domination and women have to be put back in the kitchen. Women have to be have to know their place. They are the adornments of warriors. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And sure enough, we see a lot of that. And it's a little late to put women back in the kitchen since most of them are in the, in fact, in the workforce. But you can still you can still repress them up to a certain point. And I think we see that with the whole drive against against reproductive rights against access to birth control and abortion. 
So the big question is, does anything connect all these right-wing populist movements around the world? Why is so much of this happening now? Well, in many parts of the world, we're seeing tough economic times. There's a, a lot of austerity. There's a lot of unemployment. Um, and where there isn't those things or aren't those things, there's still the fear of them. And you're much more likely to welcome a stranger to your country when you feel he's not going to take anything away from you. Even if he isn't going to take anything away from you, you might fear that he does. So it's austerity in unemployment that provide the the preconditions for the full flowering of these racist uh, uh, kinds of policies. But Austerity is not inevitable. Austerity is a conscious policy that's pushed by the World Bank, the IMF, the central governments. And we could have a different policies in, in the world today. We could have, for example, what FDR did with the New Deal, massive government spending on big employment projects, public works and public goods, more and better social services. We did that in the 30s. And I believe in the 30s, the proto-fascist movements in the United States were defeated and democracy flourished. Um, I mean, look, I'm for, I, I, I agree that things would be much better if, if everybody could get together and fight against austerity and against uh, anti-worker policies. Um, and I hope they'll do that. And I hope Democratic politicians will fight for that. Well, and let's just remember one more thing in conclusion here. Trump is the most unpopular president in our history. He lost the popular vote by three million votes. He's not doing much to win the middle and the undecideds. It seems likely, now at least, that we will vote Democrats uh, into control of the House, possibly even the Senate in November, and we'll vote Trump out of office in 2020. Uh, from your mouth to God's ears, John, and we may get rid of Trump, but Trumpism, I don't know. Trump has consolidated a block of voters united in their grievances and their fantasies of redress. The fundamentalist stay-home moms, the MAGA hat-wearing toughs, the fox-addicted retirees, the hedge fund multimillionaires, and the gun nuts have found one another. Why would they retreat and go their separate ways just because they lost an election or even two? Around the world, it may be the same story. Democracy is easy to destroy and hard to repair even if people want to do so. And it's not so clear that enough of them do. If you would love a way to financially support this show without it costing you anything, there's good news. You can support the show by bookmarking and using my affiliate link every time you shop with that company online. Y you know, basically the one company online. Lots of evil tendencies, owned by the richest dude in the world, that one. Chances are you shop there at least now and then, maybe even a lot. Perhaps you make a lot of business-related purchases, I know some of you do. Or maybe you have a standard selection of home goods you get delivered regularly. In any case... You might have some mixed feelings about it, and you'd be right to, but if you do end up using the site, at least you can help siphon off some of that corporate blood money to help support the production of this show. Your shopping experience will be identical to usual, and it won't cost you a dime more. You can get the affiliate link from the show notes on the device you're using to listen right now, or you can find it on the sidebar of the homepage at bestofleft.com. You can bookmark the link so you can set it and forget it while continuing to support us into the future. It helps more than you think, I promise it does, and the more who join in, the more it helps. So thanks for taking the time. On the one side, surely if you care about economic distribution and you care about distributive justice, the fact that there are people who are phenomenally poor in much of the world still and others who are very rich, people who struggle to have enough to eat, who lack electricity, who lack water, that is the most pressing injustice. And if the price for giving people a little bit more of those goods, a little bit more of those life's necessities, is sort of rising inequality at the level of nation state, then surely that's okay. And we should really celebrate overall the elephant curve, because by and large, the people who do worst have had real improvements in their lives that translate into something very, very meaningful to them, having food on the table, right? On the other hand, our political life world is at the level of a nation state. And there are effects of living in a really unequal society that 
go beyond that. And so I find myself really torn. I mean, I look at, you know, this curve and I say, well, this is tremendously good news, but it's also tremendously bad news. And I I suppose it's both at the same time. I agree with that. You know, I definitely agree. And that's why the world is a complicated place, because we really think we're very simple. It would not be our world, you know. But let me try to sort of discuss that a little bit more. You know, the first argument, which was really basically a cosmopolitan argument, because essentially it was a good news. And even if you can say, well, some people lost out, you know, that proverbial steel worker in Michigan lost out, but the world became a better place. Many Chinese get, got out of really abject poverty and became middle class. It is true from the cosmopolitan point of view, but using that, as some people have used, and I've disagreed, in the U.S., to basically browbeat people of the working class by saying to them, look, guys, on the world level, you're really doing very well. You have a car, you have a garage, you have some house, and you should be happy that actually people who live in $1 a day are now richer. It's a politically nonsensical statement because this is not, of course, the world that they are concerned with. And, you know, you should not really ask them to be concerned with the world, which is very far away from them. And moreover, I think actually what people would say, well, you are telling me that while you are a part of the U.S top 1% who have done extremely well. You know, one way of thinking about this is actually relatively straightforward, which is to say that we are at a moment of huge political anger. So we have to do two things. We have to understand what that anger comes from, and we have to understand what form it takes. Now, I think the economic story is a huge reason of what drives that anger, right? The experience of the 80th, 90th percentile globally, the 50th percentile in the United States of not experiencing real improvements in living standards for the past decades drives incredible anger because the promise to them has been betrayed. Now, the form that that anger takes is obviously going to depend on many factors which are non-economic. And without a doubt, the form that that anger has taken for many of Trump's more hardcore supporters has been cultural and has been racial and has been deep resentment against the improvement of living conditions for minorities over the last decades. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that, actually, you know, but that's precisely that the substantive cause, the real cause of that is economic. Yeah. The, the form which it takes, obviously, these people are not going to take necessarily form in terms of, I really want my salary or to increase by 3.2%. That's not the form that it's going to take. The form it is taking is actually, I think that is actually due to the Chinese or the African Americans who got in front of me or actually these, you know, people who are idle and do nothing and they survive on welfare. This is the form it's going to to take. Now, of course, it could take us very long, sort of far back to see, which obviously people see now as having taken place. It was that kind of a cultural expression of economic malaise has been encouraged by politicians in this country for a while, because it really provided easy votes, because you just play on the cultural issues. You don't really care to give them anything, because they basically will vote for you simply because of the sort of code words that you send. And now, of course, they're quite shocked that sort of animal which was there, which they cultivated this kind of a view, well, it has burst out on stage. So that was, I think, the surprise of many people. Back in the communist times in, in Poland, the system, the, the political system in Poland was called in communist uh, newspeak, people's democracy. So there was a joke back in the day, what is the difference between democracy and people's democracy? And uh, the answer roughly the same as between a chair and an electric chair. Uh, so I think, I, I think that the same applies to the difference between liberal and illiberal democracy. Uh, because the term illiberal, illiberal democracy is, is getting more and more popular, and it was first popularized by Farid Zakaria in his foreign affairs piece, The Rise of Illiberal Democracy. Uh, he wrote that from Peru to Palestinian Authority, from Sierra Leone to Slovakia, we see the rise of disturbing phenomenon, illiberal democracy. And Zakaria's piece made a very, to my mind, very important distinction between democracy and liberalism. Democracy, in this view, and I think that's, that's, that, that's a proper view, is a mechanism of electing political leaders. That's the way you get your 
authority. You just go and elect them. Uh, but uh, to say that the state is democratic doesn't say very much about how it is actually run. It just says how you get your politicians, how you get your authorities elected. So then the, the, the liberal component kicks in. And liberal, by contrast, is about the norms practices uh, that shape political life. James to uh, talked about it quite a lot. So a pr liberal state is one in which individual rights are protected by the rule of law, not only against uh, the abuses of, uh, of a tyrant, but also against the abuses of democratic majorities. According to Zakaria, these two components, liberalism and democracy, are becoming more and more uh, disengaged from one another, and he saw that as a, as a real threat. Now, let's jump 17 years into the future. It's the year 2014, and we are not in the United States, but in Romania. And in Romania, we are joined by uh, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who just gave a speech, on, a famous speech, on illiberal democracy, in which he not only said that illiberal democracy is not a threat, he said that that is actually the kind of state he wants to build in Hungary. And what he said, what is happening today in Hungary can be interpreted as an attempt of the respective political leadership to harmonize relationship between the interests of individuals and achievements of the country, the nation. Meaning that Hungarian nation is not as simple as some of individuals, but a community that needs to be organized, strengthened and developed. And in this sense, the new state that we are building is an illiberal state a non-liberal state. So you see, look what he's doing here. He's saying that respecting individual rights and goals uh, makes it difficult or maybe even impossible to advance national interests. Uh, furthermore, what he says, when those two collide, individual interests and national interests, national interests take precedence. And now you need to ask yourself a question. Who defines national interests? And obviously, national interests are, uh, usually are defined by the parliamentary majority, in this case, Mr. Orban and his party. Thus, uh, what I would like to say, without a healthy liberal component, democracy can easily turn into tyranny of uh, majority, or rather, given that the ruling parties hardly ever get the actual majority of the votes, it's the tyranny of the best organized minority. So, so when somebody tells you, and there are many people apart from Orban uh, doing so, because uh, let me just point out to one fact that everybody now is a Democrat. Vladimir Putin, perfectly uh, democratic. That's what he says about himself. Uh, Orban, uh, Erdogan, they never say they are undemocratic, but quite often they say they, they are just different kind of Democrats, illiberal Democrats. They just don't want the liberal part of democracy. What I'm trying to say is that there is no democracy without this liberal part, or at least it cannot last very long. But then you can ask, does it have to be this way, that democracy without liberalism must turn into some form of authoritarianism? And let me get back to this uh, joke I said at the beginning uh, about the electric chair. Well, you can sit on an electric chair and maybe be, even be quite comfortable on, on it. But the problem is, you never really know when somebody flicks the switch off. How many fascists are there in the audience today? <laughs> well, it's a bit difficult to say because we've forgotten what fascism is. People now use the term fascist as a kind of general purpose abuse, or they confuse fascism with nationalism. So let's take a few minutes to clarify what fascism actually is and how is it different from nationalism. The milder forms of nationalism have been among the most benevolent of human creations. Nations are communities of millions of strangers who don't really know each other. For example, I don't know the eight million people who share my Israeli citizenship. 
But thanks to nationalism, we can all care about one another and cooperate effectively. This is very good. Some people, like John Lennon, imagine that without nationalism, the world will be a peaceful paradise. But far more likely, without nationalism, we would have been living in tribal chaos. If you look today at the most prosperous and peaceful countries in the world, countries like Sweden and Switzerland and Japan, you will see that they have a very strong sense of nationalism. In contrast, countries that lack a strong sense of nationalism, like Congo and Somalia and Afghanistan, tend to be violent and poor. So what is fascism and how is it different from nationalism? Well, nationalism tells me that my nation is unique and that I have special obligations towards my nation. Fascism, in contrast, tells me that not my nation is supreme and that I have exclusive obligations towards it. I don't need to care about anybody or anything other than my nation. Usually, of course, people have many identities and loyalties to different groups. For example, I can be a good patriot, loyal to my country, and at the same time, be loyal to my family, my neighborhood, my profession, humankind as a whole, truth and beauty. Of course, when I have different identities and loyalties, it sometimes creates conflicts and complications. But, well, whoever told you that life was easy? Life is complicated. Deal with it. Fascism is what happens when people try to ignore the complications and to make life too easy for themselves. Fascism denies all identities except the national identity and insists that I have obligations only towards my nation. If my nation demands that I sacrifice my family, then I will sacrifice my family. If the nation demands that I kill millions of people, then I will kill millions of people. And if my nation demands that I betray truth and beauty, then I should betray truth and beauty. For example, how does a fascist evaluate art? How does a fascist decide whether a movie is a good movie or a bad movie? Well, it's very, very, very simple. So it's really just one yardstick. If the movie serves the interests of the nation, it's a good movie. If the movie doesn't serve the interests of the nation, it's a bad movie. That's it. Similarly, how does a fascist decide what to teach kids in school? Again, it's very simple. There is just one yardstick. You teach the kids whatever serves the interests of the nation. The truth doesn't matter at all. Now, the horrors of the Second World War and of the Holocaust remind us of the terrible consequences of this way of thinking. But usually, when we talk about the ills of fascism, we do so in an ineffective way, because we tend to depict fascism as a hideous monster without really explaining what was so seductive about it. It's a bit like these Hollywood movies that depict the bad guys, uh, Voldemort or Lord Sauron or Darth Vader, as ugly and mean and cruel. They're cruel even to their own supporters. When I see these movies, I never understand. Why would anybody be tempted to follow a disgusting creep like Voldemort? The problem with evil is that in real life, evil doesn't necessarily look ugly. It can look very beautiful. This is something that Christianity knew very well, which is why in Christian art, as against Hollywood, Satan is usually depicted as a gorgeous hunk. This is why it's so difficult to resist the temptations of Satan, and why it is also difficult to resist the temptations of fascism. 
Fascism makes people see themselves as belonging to the most beautiful and most important thing in the world, the nation. And then people think, well, they taught us that fascism is ugly. But when I look in the mirror, I see something very beautiful, so I can't be a fascist, right? Wrong. That's the problem with fascism. When you look in the fascist mirror, you see yourself as far more beautiful than you really are. In the 1930s, when Germans looked in the fascist mirror, they saw Germany as the most beautiful thing in the world. If today Russians look in the fascist mirror, they will see Russia as the most beautiful thing in the world. And if Israelis look in the fascist mirror, they will see Israel as the most beautiful thing in the world. This does not mean that we are now facing a rerun of the 1930s. Fascism and dictatorships might come back, but they will come back in a new form, a form which is much more relevant to the new technological realities of the 21st century. In ancient times, land was the most important asset in the world. Politics, therefore, was the struggle to control land. And dictatorship meant that all the land was owned by a single ruler or by a small oligarchy. Then in the modern age, machines became more important than land. Politics became the struggle to control the machines. And dictatorship meant that too many of the machines became concentrated in the hands of the government or of a small elite. Now data is replacing both land and machines as the most important asset. Politics becomes the struggle to control the flows of data. And dictatorship now means that too much data is being concentrated in the hands of the government or of a small elite. The greatest danger that now faces liberal democracy is that the revolution in information technology will make dictatorships more efficient than democracies. In the 20th century, democracy and capitalism defeated fascism and communism because democracy was better at processing data and making decisions. Given 20th century technology, it was simply inefficient to try and concentrate too much data and too much power in one place. But it is not a law of nature that centralized data processing is always less efficient than distributed data processing. With the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning, it might become feasible to process enormous amounts of information very efficiently in one place, to take all the decisions in one place, and then centralized data processing will be more efficient than distributed data processing. And then the main handicap of authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, their attempt to concentrate all the information in one place, it will become their greatest advantage. Another technological danger that threatens the future of democracy is the merger of information technology with biotechnology, which might result in the creation of algorithms that know me better than I know myself. And once you have such algorithms, an external system like the government cannot just predict my decisions, it can also manipulate my feelings, my emotions. A dictator may not be able to provide me with good health care, but he will be able to make me love him and to make me hate the opposition. Democracy will find it difficult to survive such a development because in the end, democracy is not based on human rationality. It's based on human feelings. During elections and referendums, you're not being asked, what do you think? You're actually being asked, how do you feel? And 
If somebody can manipulate your emotions effectively, democracy will become an emotional puppet show. So what can we do to prevent the return of fascism and the rise of new dictatorships? The number one question that we face is who controls the data? If you are an engineer, then find ways to prevent too much data from being concentrated in too few hands. And find ways to make sure the distributed data processing is at least as efficient as centralized data processing. This will be the best safeguard for democracy. As for the rest of us, who are not engineers, the number one question facing us is how not to allow ourselves to be manipulated by those who control the data. The enemies of liberal democracy, they have a method. They hack our feelings, not our emails, not our bank accounts. They hack our feelings of fear and hate and vanity and then use these feelings to polarize and destroy democracy from within. This is actually a method that Silicon Valley pioneered in order to sell us products. But now the enemies of democracy are using this very method to sell us fear and hate and vanity. They cannot create these feelings out of nothing. So they get to know our own pre-existing weaknesses and then use them against us. And it is therefore the responsibility of all of us to get to know our weaknesses and make sure that they do not become a weapon in the hands of the enemies of democracy. Getting to know our own weaknesses will also help us to avoid the trap of the fascist mirror. As we explained earlier, fascism exploits our vanity. It makes us see ourselves as far more beautiful than we really are. This is the seduction. But if you really know yourself, you will not fall for this kind of flattery. If somebody puts a mirror in front of your eyes that hides all your ugly bits and makes you see yourself as far more beautiful, and far more important than you really are, just break that mirror. We've just heard clips today, starting with the Diane Rehm Show, talking with Madeleine Albright about the rise of right-wing authoritarianism around the world. Ideas highlighted Turkish writer Elif Shafak talking about the fragility of democracy. Our midterms minute today focused on getting ready for the primaries in Arizona and Florida on August 28th. This is Hell spoke with Elian Glazer about Brexit and the uprising against status quo politics. Start Making Sense talked with Katha Pollitt about the facets of fascism around the world. The Good Fight's Yasha Monk discussed the economic causes of right-wing populism with Bronco Milanovic. And finally, we just heard Yuval Noah Harari in his TED Talk explaining the differences between fascism and nationalism and what the consolidation of our data means for the future of democracy. As always, you can find links to each of these segments in the show notes for easy reference and sharing. And to wrap up today, I just want to uh, share a few thoughts of my own. So obviously, we're discussing the concept of creeping fascism today, and that usually starts with a debate over whether or not you are currently experiencing fascism or whether you're just on the way there. And I think there is room for that debate. There is importance uh, in that debate. There is value in precision of language and understanding exactly where we are and what's happening. But the key takeaway is not the answer, yes or no, whether we are currently in fascism. The key takeaway is if you're even having the discussion, it is time to panic and take evasive maneuvers. So, of course, the first step to fighting fascism is to have a unified opposition. Fascists pretty much never have a genuine majority of people supporting them. There is only ever basically a small 
core of people who are genuine fascists and genuinely uh, support fascist governments. But following them is this sort of wide swath of people who are often called good Germans, people who just sort of go along to get along. They don't want to ruffle any feathers. They, they want to be patriotic, uh, that sort of thing. And so they don't do anything to stand in the way. And then there's the opposition. And the opposition can be either well-organized or disorganized. But this is where you get worried because, at least in America, the left is more or less represented by the Democratic Party, which has not instilled a lot of confidence in a lot of people in a long time. But this is not a, a, a fundamental problem with the Democratic Party. It's a fundamental problem with people on the left. It is absolutely foundational to people on the left to be disorganized. I went to a, a junior high school named after Will Rogers, and it took me a, you know years and years to figure out who he was. But it turns out he was a political satirist from about 100 years ago. And one of his famous quotes is, I'm not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. It's funny, and it pokes fun at the Democrats. But the deeper truth is that any party on the left is going to show those kinds of signs of being disorganized because we're not good at falling in line. We're not good at unifying under a strong central authority. We have a whole lot of different ideas about how we should organize political parties, how we should organize governments, the types of policies we want, we want to put forward. The left is just, uh, it's much more bottom up. It's wild and woolly. It, we're hard to organize. There, there's no getting around it to lament that or to argue that the left should be different and get more organized is a, a complete waste of time. Uh, it, it's just not who we are. And it takes something like that fundamental aspect of human psychology, that idea that people will get together with their enemies against a common bigger and stronger enemy, that's pretty much what it takes to get people on the left to shut up a little bit and get together and work together. So, okay, if we're fighting fascism, that seems like it should be enough to get people to come together. And that brings me to my second worry, which is the, the nature of the United States. We're debating just Trump, and so many people are losing sight of the bigger picture, which is why I thought it was important to do this episode, you know, that this is not a phenomenon happening in the US. It's a phenomenon happening all around the world, but because most other countries see themselves as a member nation of a community of nations and the United States tends to see itself as the United States and everyone else as being separate, people in the US don't pay attention to international news. I'm sure a lot of people have no idea that there is this wave of right-wing authoritarianism taking over all around the world. So if you're inside the U.S., it's harder to see that pattern. And if you're on the left, you're part of the opposition, and you don't know that, if you don't see that pattern, then it might tamp down that instinct to get together with your political adversaries who are sort of on your side, you know, you're, you're like a Bernie person trying to work with a corporate Democrat or vice versa. If, if you don't see the bigger pattern emerging, then those conflicts don't get set aside for the time being for the sake of unification. You just keep on bickering amongst yourselves. The opposition is weak and disorganized and authoritarianism has a clear path to take over. So those are the concerns. Uh, one of the things I've said before, and I, and I think I got it from someone else originally, is that Trump is the wrong answer to a lot of the right questions. That is another thing that is part of this international pattern that we need to recognize because you have to figure out what the problem is so that you know what path to go on going forward. So, so this pattern of sort of technocratic governments that cater to the elites while forgetting the middle classes and the poor is sure to stoke anger. Like populism is the natural response to that kind of a status quo. And that's what we have right now. People are angry. They're scared. Uh, th then you throw like climate change and international refugee crisis on top. And 
what we have is exactly what anyone could have predicted. So we have this populism. It's a natural response to try to tamp it down and ignore it or set it aside or you know dismiss it is simply not going to work. That is not a path forward. You cannot win power in politics in this day and age with that kind of a response. So the only thing left to do is to try to channel that populism in healthy ways, which gets us to the core of the debate within the left in the U.S., that we need to be able to solve and set aside and move forward. So hopefully the the primaries and and these uh, 2018 elections are going to be a step on the path toward unification and healing on the left, but also turning in a new direction that takes us to where we need to go. It's not just angry Trump supporters who you could dismiss as either racist or tricked by Russia or whatever. That is not the only element at play here. There is deep, deep anger across the board in America and around the world, and it is every responsible person's job to understand where that anger is coming from, why these people are angry, and to understand that our politics has to take that anger into consideration. It can't be dismissed or set aside or excused. It has to be addressed. We can't go back to moderate, business-friendly incrementalism. That's how we got to where we are. So in essence, populism is the future. It's just up to us to decide which brand of populism it's going to be. As always, keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991. That's going to be it for today. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash bestoftheleft, as that is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, All that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog, and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast, coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestoftheleft.com. Music